7% to Taiwan and Singapore for small components, 4% to the United Kingdom for marketing, and about 1% to Barbados or Ireland for data processing. Box 3.9. The largest number of poor people lives in South Asia. The poverty rate is particularly high in India, Nepal and Bangladesh, states an ILO report, Labor and Social Trends in Asia and the Pacific 2005, the study provides a stark analysis of a growing, employment gap, in the Asia region. It states that the creation of new jobs has failed to keep pace with the region's impressive economic growth. Between 2003 and 2004, employment in Asia and the Pacific increased by a disappointing 1.6%, or by 25 million jobs, to a total of 1.588 billion jobs, compared to the strong economic growth rate of over 7%. 7 Mass Media and Communications the mass media include a wide variety of forms, including television, newspapers, films, magazines, radio, advertisements, video games and CDs. They are referred to as mass media because they reach mass audiences, audiences comprised of very large numbers of people. They are also sometimes referred to as mass communications. For many in your generation it is probably difficult to imagine a world without some form of mass media and communications. Mass media is part of our everyday life. In many middle-class households across the country people wake up only to put on the radio, switch on the television, look for the morning newspaper. The younger children of the same. Households may first glance at their mobile phones to check their missed calls. Plumbers, electricians, carpenters, painters and sundry other service providers in many urban centers have a mobile telephone where they can be easily contacted. Many shops in cities increasingly have a small television set. Customers who come in may exchange bits of conversation about the cricket match being telecasted or the film being shown. Indians abroad keep regular touch with friends and families back home over the internet and telephone. Migrants from working class population in the cities are regularly in touch with their families in the villages over the phone. Have you seen the range of advertisements of mobile phones? Have you noticed the diverse social groups that they are catering to? Are you surprised that the CBSE board results are available to you on both the internet and over the mobile phone? Indeed this very book is available on the internet. It is obvious that there has been a phenomenal expansion of mass communication of all kinds in recent years. As students of sociology, there are many aspects to this growth which is of great interest to us. First, while we recognize the specificity of the current communication revolution, it is important to go back a little and sketch out the growth of modern mass media in the world and in India. This helps us realize that like any other social institution the structure and content of mass media is shaped by changes in the economic, political and socio-cultural contexts. For instance, we see how central the state and its vision of development influenced the media in the first decades after independence and how in the post-1990 period of globalization the market has a key role to play. Second, this help us better appreciate how the relationship between mass media and communication with society is dialectical. Both influence each other. The nature and role of mass media is influenced by the society in which it is located. At the same time the far-reaching influence of mass media on society cannot be overemphasized. We shall see this dialectical relationship when we discuss in this chapter, at the role of media in colonial India, b, in the first decades after independence and, c, and finally in the context of globalization. Third, mass communication is different from other means of communication as it requires a formal structural organization to meet large scale capital, production and management demands. You will find, therefore, that the state and or the market have a major role in the structure and functioning of mass media. Mass media functions through very large organizations with major investments and large body of employees. Fourth, there are sharp differences between how easily different sections of people can use mass media. You will recall the concept of digital divide from the last chapter. 7.1 The Beginnings of Modern Mass Media the first modern mass media institution began with the development of the printing press. 
Although the history of print in certain societies dates back to many centuries, the first attempts at printing books using modern technologies began in Europe. This technique was first developed by Johann Gutenberg in 1440. Initial attempts at printing were restricted to religious books. With the Industrial Revolution, the print industry also grew. The first products of the press were restricted to an audience of literate elites. It was only in the mid 19 th century with further development in technologies transportation and literacy that newspapers began to reach out to a mass audience people living in different corners of the country found themselves reading or hearing the same news it has been suggested that this was in many ways responsible for people across a country to feel connected and develop a sense of belonging or we feeling the well-known scholar Benedict Anderson has thus argued that this helped the growth of nationalism, the feeling that people who did not even know of each other's existence feel like members of a family. It gave people who would never meet each other a sense of togetherness. Anderson thus suggested that we could think of the nation as an imagined community. You will recall how 19. Th. Century social reformers often wrote and debated in newspapers and journals. The growth of Indian nationalism was closely linked to its struggle against colonialism. It emerged in the wake of the institutional changes brought about by British rule in India. Anti-colonial public opinion was nurtured and channelized by the nationalist press, which was vocal in its opposition to the oppressive measures of the colonial state. This led the colonial government to clamp down on the nationalist press and impose censorship, for instance during the Ilbert Bill agitation in 1883. Association with the national movement led some of the nationalist newspapers like Kesari, Marathi, Mathrubhumi, Malayalam, Amrita Bazar Patrika, English, to suffer the displeasure of the colonial state. But that did not prevent them from advocating the nationalist cause and demand an end to colonial rule. Under British rule newspapers and magazines, films and radio comprised the range of mass media. Radio was wholly owned by the state. National views could not be, therefore, expressed. Newspapers and films though autonomous from the state were strictly monitored by the Raj. Newspapers and magazines either in English or vernacular were not very widely circulated as the literate public was limited. Yet their influence far outstripped their circulation as news and information was read and spread by word of mouth from commercial and administrative hubs like markets and trading centers as well as courts and towns. The print media carried a range of opinion, which expressed their ideas of a free India. These variations were carried over to independent India. Our audio. Radio broadcasting which commenced in India through amateur, ham, broadcasting clubs in Kolkata and Chennai in the 1920s matured into a public broadcasting system in the 1940s during the World War II when it became a major instrument of propaganda for Allied forces in Southeast Asia. At the time of independence there were only six radio stations located in the major cities catering primarily to an urban audience. By 1950 there were 546,200 radio licenses all over India. In independent India, Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister, called upon the media to function as the watchdog of democracy. The media was expected to spread the spirit of self-reliance and national development among the people. You will recall the general thrust of development in the early years of independence in India from your earlier chapters. The media was seen as a means to inform the people of the various developmental efforts. The media was also encouraged to fight against oppressive social practices like untouchability, child marriages, and ostracism of widows, as well as beliefs of witchcraft and faith healing. A rational, scientific ethos was to be promoted for the building of a modern industrial society. The film's division of the government produced newsreels and documentaries. These were shown before the screening of films in every movie theater, documenting the development process as directed by the state. 7.2 MS Amadea in INDEPENDENTINDIA. TE. The PPROACH. Since the media was seen as an active partner in the development of the newly free nation, the AIRS programs consisted mainly of news, current affairs, discussions on development. The box below captures the spirit of those times.
Apart from All India Radio, Air, Broadcasts News there was Vivi Bharati, a channel for entertainment that was primarily broadcasting Hindi film songs on listeners' request. In 1957 Air acquired the hugely popular channel Vivi Bharati, which soon began to carry sponsored programs and advertisements and grew to become a money-spinning channel for Air. When India gained independence in 1947, All India Radio had an infrastructure of six radio stations, located in metropolitan cities. The country had 280,000 radio receiver sets for a population of 350 million people. After independence the government gave priority to the expansion of the radio broadcasting infrastructure, especially in state capitals and in border areas. Over the years, AIR has developed a formidable infrastructure for radio broadcasting in India. It operates a three-tiered, national, regional, and local, service to cater to India's geographic, linguistic and cultural diversity. The major constraint for the popularization of radio initially was the cost of the radio set. The transistor revolution in the 1960s made the radio more accessible by making it mobile as battery-operated sets and reducing the unit price substantially. In 2000 around 110 million households, two-thirds of all Indian households were listening to radio broadcasts in 24 languages and 146 dialects. More than a third of them were rural households. Television Television programming was introduced experimentally in India to promote rural development as early as 1959. Later the satellite instructional television experiment site broadcasted directly to community viewers in the rural areas of six states between August 1975 and July 1976. These instructional broadcasts were broadcast to 2,400 TV sets directly for four hours daily. Meanwhile, television stations were set up under Doordarshan in four cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Srinagar and Amritsar, by 1975. Three more stations in Kolkata, Chennai and Jalandhar were added within a year. Every broadcasting center had its own mix of programs comprising news, children's and women's programs, farmers' programs as well as entertainment programs. As programs become commercialized and were allowed to carry advertisements of its sponsors, a shift in target audience was evident. Entertainment programs grew and were directed to the urban consuming class. The advent of color broadcasting during the 1982 Asian Games in Delhi and the rapid expansion of the national network led to rapid commercialization of television broadcasting. During 1984 to 1985 the number of television transmitters increased all over India covering a large proportion of the population. It was also the time when indigenous soap operas like Hum Log 1984 to 85 and Buniyad 1986 to 87 were aired. They were hugely popular acclaim and attracted substantial advertising revenue for Doordarshan as did the broadcasting of the epics Ramayana, 1987-88, and Mahabharat, 1988-90. Print Media The beginnings of the print media and its role in both the spread of the social reform movement and the nationalist movement have been noted. After independence, the print media continued to share the general approach of being a partner in the task of nation-building by taking up developmental issues as well as giving voice to the widest section of people. The brief extract in the box below will give you a sense of the commitment. The gravest challenge that the media faced was with the declaration of emergency in 1975 and censorship of the media. Fortunately, the period ended and democracy was restored in 1977. India with its many problems can be justifiably proud of a free media. At the start of the chapter we had mentioned how mass media is different from other means of communication as it requires a formal structural organization to meet large-scale capital, production and management demands. And also like any other social institution the mass media also varies in structure and content according to different economic, political and socio-cultural context. You will now notice how at different points in time both the content and style of media changes. At some points the state has a greater role to play. At other times the market is. In India this shift is very visible in recent times. This change has also led to debates about what role the media ought to play in a modern democracy. We look at these new developments in the next section.
7.3 Globalization and the Media We have already read about the far-reaching impact of globalization as well as its close link with the communication revolution in the last chapter. The media have always had international dimensions, such as the gathering of new stories and the distribution of primarily Western films overseas. However, until the 1970s most media companies operated within specific domestic markets in accordance with regulations from national governments. The media industry was also differentiated into distinct sectors, for the most part cinema, print media, radio and television broadcasting all operated independently of one another. In the past three decades, however, profound transformations have taken place within the media industry. National markets have given way to a fluid global market, while new technologies have led to the fusion of forms of media that were once distinct. We began with the case of the music industry and the far-reaching consequences that globalization has had on it. The changes that have taken place in mass media is so immense that this chapter will probably be only able to give you a fragmentary understanding. As a young generation you can build up on the information provided. Let us have a look at the changes that globalization has brought about on the print media, primarily newspapers and magazines, the electronic media, primarily television, and on the radio. Print media. We have seen how important newspapers and magazines were for the spread of the freedom movement. It is often believed that with the growth of the television and the internet the print media would be sidelined. However, in India we have seen the circulation of newspapers grow. As the box 7.9 suggests new technologies have helped boost the production and circulation of newspapers. A large number of glossy magazines have also made their entry into the market. As is evident, the reasons for this amazing growth in Indian language newspapers are many. First, there is a rise in the number of literate people who are migrating to cities. The Hindi Daily Hindustan in 2003 printed 64,000 copies of their Delhi edition, which jumped to 425,000 by 2005. The reason was that, of Delhi's population of 1 crore and 47 lakhs, 52% had come from the Hindi belt of the two states of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar. Out of this, 47% have come from a rural background and 60% of them are less than 40 years of age. Second, the needs of the readers in the small towns and villages are different from that of the cities and the Indian language newspapers cater to those needs. Dominant Indian language newspapers such as Malayala Manorama and the Inadu launched the concept of local news in a significant manner by introducing district and whenever necessary, block editions. Dinathanthi, another leading Tamil newspaper, has always used simplified and colloquial language. The Indian language newspapers have adopted advanced printing technologies and also attempted supplements, pullouts, and literary and niche booklets. Marketing strategies have also marked the Danik Bhaskar Group's growth as they carry out consumer contact programs, door-to-door -door surveys, and research. This also brings back the point that modern mass media has to have a formal structural organization. While English newspapers, often called national dailies, circulate across regions, vernacular newspapers have vastly increased their circulation in the states and the rural hinterland. In order to compete with the electronic media, newspapers, especially English-language newspapers have on the one hand reduced prices and on the other hand brought out editions from multiple centers. Many feared that the rise in electronic media would lead to a decline in the circulation of print media. This has not happened. Indeed it has expanded. This process has, however, often involved cuts in prices and increasing dependence on the sponsors of advertisements who in turn have a larger say in the content of newspapers. The box below captures the logic of this practice. Television. In 1991 there was one state-controlled TV channel Doordarshan in India. By 1998 there were almost 70 channels. Privately run satellite channels have multiplied rapidly since the mid-1990s. While Doordarshan broadcasts over 20 channels there were some 40 private television networks broadcasting in 2000. The staggering growth of private satellite television has been one of the defining developments of contemporary India. In 2002, 134 million individuals watched satellite TV on an average every week. 
This number went up to 190 million in 2005. The number of homes with access to satellite TV has jumped from 40 million in 2002 to 61 million in 2005. Satellite subscription has now penetrated 56% of all TV homes. The Gulf War of 1991, which popularized CNN, and the launching of Star TV in the same year by the Wampoa Hutchinson Group of Hong Kong, signaled the arrival of private satellite channels in India. In 1992, ZTV, a Hindu-based satellite entertainment channel, also began beaming programs to cable television viewers in India. By 2000, 40 private cable and satellite channels were available including several that focused exclusively on regional language broadcasting like Sun TV, Inadu TV, Udaya TV, RAJ TV, and Asianet. Meanwhile, ZTV has also launched several regional networks broadcasting in Marathi, Bengali and other languages. While Doordarshan was expanding rapidly in the 1980s, the cable television industry was mushrooming in major Indian cities. The VCR greatly multiplied entertainment options for Indian audiences, providing alternatives to Doordarshan's single-channel programming. Video viewing at home and in community-based parlors increased rapidly. The video fair consisted mostly of film-based entertainment, both domestic and imported. By 1984, entrepreneurs in cities such as Mumbai and Ahmedabad had begun wiring apartment buildings to transmit several films a day. The number of cable operators exploded from 100 in 1984, to 1200 in 1988, to 15,000 in 1992, and to about 60,000 in 1999. The coming in of transnational television companies like Star TV, MTV, Channel, V, Sony and others, worried some people on the likely impact on Indian youth and on the Indian cultural identity. But most of the transnational television channels have through research realized that the use of the familiar is more effective in procuring the diverse groups that constitute Indian audience. The early strategy of Sony International was to broadcast 10 Hindi films a week, gradually decreasing the number as the station produced its own Hindi language content. The majority of the foreign networks have now introduced either a segment of Hindi language programming, MTV India, or an entire new Hindi language channel, Star Plus. Star Sports and ESPN have dual commentary or an audio soundtrack in Hindi. The larger players have launched specific regional channels in languages such as Bengali, Punjabi, Marathi and Gujarati. Perhaps the most dramatic adoption of localization was carried out by Star TV. In October 1996, Star Plus, initially an all-English general entertainment channel originating from Hong Kong, began producing a Hindi-language belt of programming between 7 and 9 p.m. By February 1999, the channel was converted to a solely Hindi channel and all-English serials shifted to Star World, the network's English-language international channel. Advertising to promote the change included the Hinglish slogan, Opki Boli. AAPKA plus point, your language, speech. Your plus point butcher, 2003. Both Star and Sony continued to dub US programming for younger audiences children appeared to be able to adjust to the peculiarities that arise when the language is one and the setting another. Have you watched a dubbed program? What do you feel about it? Box 7.14. The Rescue of Prince. Prince, a five years old boy, had fallen into a 55 feet borewell shaft in Aldaharhi village in Kurukshetra, Haryana, and was rescued by the army after a 50 hours ordeal in which a parallel shaft was dug through a well. Along with food, a closed circuit television camera, CCTV, had been lowered into the shaft in which the little boy was trapped. Two News Channel, suspended all other programs and reporting of all other events and for two days continuous footage of the child bravely fighting off insects, sleeping or crying out to his mother was splashed on the TV screen. They even interviewed many people outside the temples asking them, what do you feel about Prince? They asked people to send SMS for Prince. Prince Kaili AAAPKA Sandesh Haymine Beha XXX Pay. Thousands of people had descended at the site and several free community kitchens were run for two days. It soon created a national hysteria and concern and people were shown praying in temples, mosques, churches and gurdwaras.
There are other such instances when the TV is shown to intrude into personal lives of people. Most television channels are on throughout the day, 24 into 7. The format for news is lively and informal. News has been made far more immediate, democratic and intimate. Television has fostered public debate and is expanding its reach every passing year. This brings us to the question whether serious political and economic issues are neglected. There are a growing number of news channels in Hindi and English, a large number of regional channels and an equally large number of reality shows, talk shows, Bollywood shows, family soaps, interactive shows, game shows and comedy shows. Entertainment television has produced a new cadre of superstars who have become familiar household names, and their private life, rivalry on sets feed the gossip columns of popular magazines and newspapers. Reality shows like Khan Banega Kropati or Indian Idol or Big Boss have become increasingly popular. Most of these are modeled along the lines of Western programs. Which of these programs can be identified as interactive shows, as family soaps, talk shows, reality shows? Discuss. Radio. In 2000, airs programs could be heard in twa third of all Indian households in 24 languages and 146 dialects, over some 120 million radio sets. The advent of privately owned FM radio stations in 2002 provided a boost to entertainment programs over radio. In order to attract audiences these privately run radio stations sought to provide entertainment to its listeners. As privately run FM channels are not permitted to broadcast any political news bulletins, many of these channels specialize in particular kinds of popular music to retain their audiences. One such FM channel claims that it broadcasts all hits all day. Most of the FM channels which are popular among young urban professionals and students often belong to media conglomerates. Like Radio Murchi, belongs to the Times of India group. Red FM is owned by Living Media and Radio City by the Star Network. But independent radio stations engaged in public broadcastings like National Public Radio, USA, or BBC, UK, are missing from our broadcasting landscape. In the two films, Rang de Basanti, and Laj Raho Munai Bai, the radio is used as an active medium of communication although both the movies are set in the contemporary period. In Rang de Basanti, the conscientious, angry college youth, inspired by the legend of Bhagat Singh assassinates a minister and then captures all India radio to reach out to the people and disseminate their message. While in Laj Raho Muna Bai, the heroine is a radio jockey who wakes up the country with her hearty and full-throated, good morning Mumbai. The hero too takes recourse to the radio station to save a girl's life. The potential for using FM channels is enormous. Further privatization of radio stations and the emergence of community-owned radio stations would lead to the growth of radio stations. The demand for local news is growing. The number of homes listening to FM in India has also reinforced the worldwide trend of networks getting replaced by local radio. The box below reveals not only the ingenuity of a village youth but also the need for catering to local cultures. Conclusion that mass media is an essential part of our personal and public life today cannot be emphasized enough. This chapter in no way can capture your life experience with the media. What it does do is attempt to understand it as an important part of contemporary society. It also seeks to focus on its many dimensions, its link with the state and the market, its social organization and management, its relationship with readers and audience. In other words it looks at both the constraints within which media operates and the many ways that it affects our lives. Box 7.1. Number 1. Though a few newspapers had been started by people before Raja Ramahan Roy, his Sambad Kaumudi in Bengali published in 1821, and Marachal Akbar in Persian published in 1822, were the first publications in India with a distinct nationalist and democratic approach. Fardunji Mersbin was the pioneer of the Gujarati press in Bombay. It was as early as 1822 that he started the Bombay Samachar as a daily. Ishwar Chandra Vidyasagar started the Shom Prakash in Bengali in 1858. The Times of India was founded in Bombay in 1861. The pioneer in Allahabad in 1865. The Madras Mail in 1868. 
The Statesman in Calcutta in 1875. The Civil and Military Gazette in Lahore in 1876. Box 7.2. Airs broadcasts did make a difference. In the 1960s, when the high-yielding varieties of food crops, as a part of the Green Revolution, were introduced for the first time in the country. It was All India Radio which undertook a major countryside campaign on these crops on a sustained day-to-day -day basis for over 10 years from 1967. For this purpose, special programs on the high-yielding varieties were formed in many stations of air all over the country. These program units, manned by subject specialists, undertook field visits and recorded and broadcast first-hand accounts of the farmers, who started growing the new varieties of paddy and wheat. Box 7.3. Indian film songs and commercials were considered low culture and not promoted. So Indian listeners tuned their shortwave radio sets to Radio Salon, broadcasting from neighboring Sri Lanka, and to Radio Goa, broadcasting from Goa then under Portuguese rule, in order to enjoy Indian film music, commercials, and other entertainment fare. The popularity of these broadcasts in India spurred radio listening and the sale of radio sets. When purchasing a radio set, the buyer would invariably confirm with the vendor that the set could be tuned to Radio Salon or Radio Goa. Box 7.4. Wars, Tragedies and Expansion of Air. Interestingly wars and tragedies have spurred air to expand its activities. The 1962 war with China prompted the launching of a TOX unit to put out a daily program. In August 1971, with the Bangladesh crises looming, the news service division introduced news on the hour, from 6 o'clock in the morning to midnight. It took another crisis, the tragic assassination of Rajiv Gandhi in 1991, for air to take one more step of having bulletins round the clock. Box 7.5. Hum Log, A Turning Point. Hum Log was India's first long-running soap opera. This pioneering program utilized the entertainment education strategy by intentionally placing educational content in this entertainment message. Some 156 episodes of Humlog were broadcast in Hindi for 17 months in 1984 to 1985. The television program promoted such social themes as gender equality, small family size, and national integration. At the end of each 22-minute episode, a famous Indian actor, Ashok Kumar, summarized the educational lessons from the episode in an epilogue of 30 to 40 seconds. Kumar connected the drama to viewers' everyday lives. For instance, he might comment on a negative character who is drunk and beats his wife by asking, why do you think that people like Basisar Ram drink too much, and then behave badly? Do you know anyone like this? What can be done to reduce incidents of alcoholism? What can you do? Singhal and Rogers, 1989. A study of Humlog's audience showed that a high degree of parasocial interaction occurred between the audience members and their favorite Humlog characters. For example, many Humlog viewers reported that they routinely adjusted their daily schedules to meet their favorite character in the privacy of their living rooms. Many other individuals reported talking to their favorite characters through the television sets, for instance, do not worry, Badki. Do not give up your dream of making a career. Humlog achieved audience ratings of 65 to 90 percent in North India and between 20 and 45 percent in South India. About 50 million individuals watched the average broadcast of Humlog. One unusual aspect of this soap opera was the huge number of letters, over 400,000, that it attracted from viewers, so many that most of them could not be opened by. Doordarshan officials. Singhal and Rogers 2001. Box 7.6. The advertising carried by Humlog promoted a new consumer product in India, Magi 2-Minute Noodles. The public rapidly accepted this new consumer product, suggesting the power of television commercials. Advertisers began to line up to purchase airtime for television advertising, and the commercialization of Doordarshan began. Box 7.7. .7. Journalism in India used to be regarded as a calling. Fired by the spirit of patriotic and social reforming idealism, it was able to draw in outstanding talent as the freedom struggle and movements for social change intensified and as new educational and career opportunities arose in a modernizing society. 
As is often the case with such pursuits, the calling was conspicuously underpaid. The transformation of the calling into a profession took place over a long period, mirroring the change in character of a newspaper like the Hindu from a purely societal and public service mission into a business enterprise framed by a societal and public service mission. Biox 7.8. Globalization in the case of music. It has been argued that the musical form is one that lends itself to globalization more efficiently than any other. This is because music is able to reach people who may not know the written and spoken language. The growth of technology from personal stereo systems to music television, such as the MTV, to the compact disc, CD, have provided newer, more sophisticated ways for music to be distributed globally. The fusion of forms of media. Although the music industry is becoming ever more concentrated in the hands of a few international conglomerates, some feel that it is under a great threat. This is because the internet allows music to be downloaded digitally, rather than purchased in the form of CDs or cassettes from local music stores. The global music industry is currently comprised of a complex network of factories, distribution chains, music shops and sales staff. If the internet removes the need for all these elements by allowing music to be marketed and downloaded directly, what will be left of the music industry? Box 7.9. The Indian language newspaper revolution. The most significant happening in the last few decades has been the Indian language newspaper revolution. The beginnings of this growth predated liberalization. The top two dailies in India are Dainik Jagran and Dainik Bhaskar with a readership of 21 million and 17 million, respectively. The fastest growing dailies are the Assamese dailies in urban areas, 51.8% increase, and the Bengali dailies in rural areas, 129%. The Inadu story also exemplifies the success of the Indian language press. Ramaji Rao, the founder of Inadu, had successfully organized a chitfind before launching the paper in 1974. By associating with appropriate causes in the rural areas like the anti Iraq movement in the mid 1980s, the Telugu newspaper was able to reach into the countryside. This prompted it to launch district dailies in 1989. These were tabloid inserts or sensational features carrying news from particular districts as well as classified advertisements from villages and small towns of the same. By 1998 Inadu was being published from 10 towns in Andhra Pradesh and its circulation accounted for 70% of the audited Telugu daily circulation. Box 7.10. Shift in circulation of newspapers in India. According to recently published data of National Readership Study, NRS 2006, the largest growth in readership has been in Hindi Belt. Indian language dailies as a whole have grown substantially in the last year from 191 million readers to 203.6 million readers. The readership of English dailies on the other hand, has stagnated at around 21 million. Hindi dailies Dainik Jagran, with 21.2 million, and Dainik Bhaskar, with 21.0 million, are heading the list, while the Times of India is the only English daily with a readership of over 5 million, 7.4 million. Of the 18 dailies which are in 5 million club, 6 are in Hindi, 3 in Tamil, 2 each in Gujarati, Malayalam and Marathi and 1 each in Bengali, Telugu and English, the Hindu, Delhi. August 30, 2006. Box 7.11. Changes in newspaper production, the role of technology. From the late 1980s and early 1990s, newspapers have become fully automatic, from reporter's desk to final page proof. The use of paper has been completely eliminated with this automated chain. This has become possible because of two technological changes, networking of personal computers PCs through LANs, local area networks, and use of newsmaking software like Newsmaker and other customized software. Changing technology has also changed the role and function of a reporter. The basic tools of a news reporter, a shorthand notebook, pen, typewriter, and plain old telephone has been replaced by new tools, a mini tape recorder, a laptop or a PC, mobile or satellite phone, and other accessories like modem. All these technological changes in news gathering have increased the speed of news and helped newspaper managements to push their deadlines to dawn.
they are also able to plan a greater number of editions and provide the latest news to the readers. A number of language newspapers are using the new technologies to bring out separate editions for each of the districts. While print centers are limited, the number of editions has grown manifold. Newspaper chains like Mirat based Amar Yuhala are using new technology for news gathering as well as for improving pictorial coverage. The newspaper has a network of nearly a hundred reporters and staffers and an equal number of photographers, feeding news to all its 13 editions spread across Uttar Pradesh and Uttaranchal. All the hundred correspondents are equipped with PCs and modems for news transmission, and the photographers carry digital cameras with them. Digital images are sent to the central news desk via modems. Box 7.12. A media manager explains the reasons for this. The trouble with the print media is the high gestation period for returns and the high cost of production. The newspapers or magazines cover price alone does not cover these costs. If the cost of producing the paper is ours. 5. And if you are selling it at ours. 2. Then you are selling it at a higher subsidy. Naturally, you have to depend on advertising cost to cover your cost. The advertiser, thus becomes the primary customer of the print media, so, I, the print media, am not trying to get readers for my product, but I get customers, who happen to be my readers, for my advertisers. Advertisers like to reach readers who are successful, who celebrate life, who consume, who are early adopters, who believe in experimentation, who are hedonists. The then director of the Press Institute of India elaborates on the implications of newspapers that cater to potential customers of advertisers. For several weeks I have been going through mainline English language newspapers looking specifically for field reports and feature articles on happenings in the rural parts of our country, small towns and growing slum colonies. Some 70% of our people live in these areas which, to my mind, comprise the real India. The national press presumed to provide the information that molds the opinions of senior policy makers, politicians, academics and journalists themselves. They are expected to serve as watchdog over the system of governance, a role traditionally described as that of the fourth estate. Box 7.13 the effort of the newspapers has been to widen their audience and reach out to different groups. It has been argued that newspaper reading habits have changed. While the older people read the newspaper in its entirety, younger readers often have specific interests like sports, entertainment or society gossip and directly move to the pages earmarked for these items. Segmented interest of readers imply that a newspaper must have a plurality of stories to appeal to a wide range of readers with varied interests. This has often led to newspapers advocating infotainment, a combination of information and entertainment to sustain the interest of readers. Production of newspaper is no longer related to a commitment to certain values that embody a tradition. Newspapers have become a consumer product and as long as numbers are big, everything is up for sale. Box 7.15. Soap opera. Soap operas are stories that are serialized. They are continuous. Individual stories may come to an end, and different characters appear and disappear, but the soap itself has no ending until it is taken off the air completely. Soap operas presume a history, which the regular viewer knows, he or she becomes familiar with the characters, with their personalities and their life experiences. Box 7.16. It may well be the only village FM radio station on the Asian subcontinent. The transmission equipment, costing little, may be the cheapest in the world. But the local people definitely love it. On a balmy morning in India's northern state of Bihar, young Raghav Mahato gets ready to fire up his homegrown FM radio station. Thousands of villagers, living in a 20 kilometers 12 miles, radius of Raghav's small repair shop and radio station, tune their radio sets to catch their favorite station. After the crackle of static, a young, confident voice floats up the radio waves. Good morning. Welcome to Raghav FM Mansorpur 1. Now listen to your favorite songs, announces anchor and friend Sambu into a cello de peplastered microphone surrounded by racks of local music tapes.
For the next 12 hours, Raghav Mahato's Outback FM radio station plays film songs and broadcasts public interest messages on HIV and polio, and even snappy local news, including alerts on missing children and the opening of local shops. Raghav and his friend run the indigenous radio station out of Raghav's Thatchedruv Priya Electronics Shop. The place is a cramped, rented shack stacked with music tapes and rusty electrical appliances which doubles up as Ragov's radio station and repair shop. He may not be literate, but Ragov's ingenuous FM station has made him more popular than local politicians. Ragov's love affair with the radio began in 1997 when he started out as a mechanic in a local repair shop. When the shop owner left the area, Raghav, son of a Kansaridan farm worker, took over the shack with his friend. Sometime in 2003, Raghav, who by now had learned much about radio. In impoverished Bihar state, where many areas lack power supplies, the cheap battery-powered transistor remains the most popular source of entertainment. It took a long time to come up with the idea and make the kit which could transmit my programs at a fixed radio frequency. The kit cost me 50 rupees, says Raghav. The transmission kit is fitted onto an antenna attached to a bamboo pole on a neighboring three-story hospital. A long wire connects the contraption to a creaky, old homemade stereo cassette player in Raghav's radio shack. Three other rusty, locally made battery-powered tape recorders are connected to it with colorful wires and a cordless microphone. The shack has some 200 tapes of local Bhojpuri, Bollywood and devotional songs, which Raghav plays for his listeners. Raghav's station is truly a labor of love he does not earn anything from it. His electronic repair shop work brings him some 2,000 rupees a month. The young man, who continues to live in a shack with his family, does not know that running a FM station requires a government license. I do not know about this. I just began this out of curiosity and expanded its area of transmission every year, he says. So when some people told him some time ago that his station was illegal, he actually shut it down. But local villagers thronged his shack and persuaded him to resume services again. It hardly matters for the locals that Raghav FM Mansorpur 1 does not have a government license, they just love it. Women listen to my station more than men, he says. Though Bollywood and local Bhojpuri songs are staple diet, I air devotional songs at dawn and dusk for women and old people. Since there's no phone aid facility, people send their requests for songs through couriers carrying handwritten messages and phone calls to a neighboring public telephone office. Ragov's fame as the promoter of a radio station has spread far and wide in Bihar. People have written to him, wanting work at his station, and evinced interest in buying his technology. 8. Social. Movements. A great many students and office workers around the world go to work only for five or six days. And rest on the weekends. Yet, very few people who relax on their day off realize that this holiday is the outcome of a long struggle by workers. That the workday should not exceed eight hours, that men and women should be paid equally for doing the same work, that workers are entitled to social security and pension, these and many other rights were gained through social movements. Social movements have shaped the world we live in and continue to do so. We often assume that the rights we enjoy just happen to exist. It is important to recall the struggles of the past, which made these rights possible. You have read about the 19. Th. Century social reform movements. Of the struggles against caste and gender discrimination and of the nationalist movement in India that brought us independence from colonial rule in 1947. You are familiar also with the many nationalist movements around the world in Asia and Africa and Americas that put an end to colonial rule. The socialist movements world over, the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1950s and 1960s that fought for equal rights for blacks, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa have all changed the world in fundamental ways. Social movements not only change societies. They also inspire other social movements. You saw in Chapter 3 how the Indian National Movement shaped the making of the Indian Constitution and how in turn the Indian constitution played a major role in bringing about social change. 8.1 Features of a Social Movement 
People may damage a bus and attack its driver when the bus has run over a child. This is an isolated incident of protest. Since it flares up and dies down it is not a social movement. A social movement requires sustained collective action over time. Such action is often directed against the state and takes the form of demanding changes in state policy or practice. Spontaneous, disorganized protest cannot be called a social movement either. Collective action must be marked by some degree of organization. This organization may include a leadership and a structure that defines how members relate to each other, make decisions and carry them out. Those participating in a social movement also have shared objectives and ideologies. A social movement has a general orientation or way of approaching to bring about, or to prevent, change. These defining features are not constant. They may change over the course of a social movement's life. Social movements often arise with the aim of bringing about changes on a public issue, such as ensuring the right of the tribal population to use the forests or the right of displaced people to settlement and compensation. Think of other issues that social movements have taken up in the past and present. While social movements seek to bring in social change, counter-movements sometimes arise in defense of status quo. There are many instances of such counter-movements. When Raja Ramahan Roy campaigned against Sati and formed the Brahmo Samaj, defenders of Sati formed Dharma Sabha and petitioned the British not to legislate against Sati. When reformers demanded education for girls, many protested that this would be disastrous for society. When reformers campaigned for widow remarriage, they were socially boycotted. When the so-called, lower-caste children enrolled in schools, some so-called, upper-caste children were withdrawn from the schools by their families. Peasant movements have often been brutally suppressed. More recently the social movements of erstwhile excluded groups like the Dalits have often invoked retaliatory action. Likewise proposals for extending reservation in educational institutions have led to counter-movements opposing them. Social movements cannot change society easily. Since it goes against both entrenched interests and values, there is bound to be opposition and resistance. But over a period changes do take place. While protest is the most visible form of collective action, a social movement also acts in other, equally important, ways. Social movement activists hold meetings to mobilize people around the issues that concern them. Such activities help shared understanding and prepare for a feeling of agreement or consensus about how to pursue the collective agenda. Social movements also chart out campaigns that include lobbying with the government, media and other important makers of public opinion. You will recall this discussion from Chapter 3. Social movements also develop distinct modes of protest. This could be candle and torchlight processions, use of black cloth, street theaters, songs, poetry. Gandhi adopted novel ways such as Ahimsa, Satyagraha and his use of the Charka in the freedom movement. Recall the innovative modes of protest such as picketing and the defying of the colonial ban on producing salt. Distinguishing social change and social movements. It is important to distinguish between social change in general and social movements. Social change is continuous and ongoing. The broad historical processes of social change are the sum total of countless individual and collective actions gathered across time and space. Social movements are directed towards some specific goals. It involves long and continuous social effort and action by people. To draw from our discussion in Chapter 2 we can view Sanskritization and Westernization as social change and see the 19. Th. Century Social. Reforma's efforts to change society as social movements. 8.2 Sociology and Social Movements. Why the study of social movements is important for sociology. From the very beginning, the discipline of sociology has been interested in social movements. The French Revolution was the violent culmination of several movements aimed at overthrowing the monarchy and establishing, liberty, equality and fraternity. In Britain, the Industrial Revolution was marked by great social upheaval. Recall our discussion on the emergence of sociology in the West in Book 1 NCERT Class 11. Poor laborers and artisans who had left the countryside to find work in the cities protested against the inhuman living conditions into which they were forced. Food riots in England were often suppressed by the government. 
These protests were perceived by elites as a major threat to the established order of society. Their anxiety about maintaining social order was reflected in the work of sociologist Emile Durkheim. Durkheim's writings about the division of labor and society, forms of religious life, and even suicide, mirror his concern about how social structures enable social integration. Social movements were seen as forces that led to disorder. Scholars influenced by the ideas of Karl Marx offered a different view of violent collective action. Historians like E. P. Thompson showed that the crowd, and the mob, were not made up of anarchic hooligans out to destroy society. Instead, they too had a moral economy. In other words they have their own shared understanding of right and wrong that informed their actions. Their research showed that poor people in urban areas had good reasons for protesting. They often resorted to public protest because they had no other way of expressing their anger and resentment against deprivation. Theories of social movements According to the theory of relative deprivation, social conflict arises when a social group feels that it is worse off than others around it. Such conflict is likely to result in successful collective protest. This theory emphasizes the role of psychological factors such as resentment and rage in inciting social movements. The limitations of this theory are that while perceptions of deprivation may be a necessary condition for collective action, they are not a sufficient reason in themselves. All instances where people feel relatively deprived do not result in social movements. Can you think of any example where people do feel deprived but do not start or join a social movement to redress their grievance? To mobilize collectively in a sustained and organized manner, grievances have to be discussed and analyzed in order to arrive at a shared ideology and strategy. That is, there is no automatic causal relationship between relative deprivation and collective action. There are other factors such as leadership and organization that are equally important. Manker Olson's book The Logic of Collective Action argues that a social movement is an aggregation of rational individual actors pursuing their self-interest. A person will join a social movement only if s. he will gain something from it. s. he will participate only if the risks are less than the gains. Olson's theory is based on the notion of the rational, utility-maximizing individual. Do you think people always calculate individual costs and benefits before undertaking any action? McCarthy and Zald's proposed resource mobilization theory rejected Olson's assumption that social movements are made up of individuals pursuing their self-interest. Instead, they argued that a social movement's success depends on its ability to mobilize resources or means of different sorts. If a movement can muster resources such as leadership, organizational capacity, and communication facilities, and can use them within the available political opportunity structure, it is more likely to be effective. Critics argue that a social movement is not limited by existing resources. It can create resources such as new symbols and identities. As numerous poor people's movements show, scarcity of resources need not be a constraint. Even with an initial limited material resources and organizational base, a movement can generate resources through the process of struggle. Think of examples from both the past and the contemporary period. Social conflict does not automatically lead to collective action. For such action to take place, a group must consciously think or identify themselves as oppressed beings. There has to be an organization, leadership, and a clear ideology. Often, however, social protest does not follow on these lines. People may have a clear idea of how they are exploited, but they are often unable to challenge this through overt political mobilization and protest. In his book Weapons of the Week, James Scott analyzed the lives of peasants and laborers in Malaysia. Protest against injustice took the form of small acts such as being deliberately slow. These kinds of acts have been defined as everyday acts of resistance. 8.3 Types of Social Movements One way of classifying, reformist, redemptive, revolutionary. There are different kinds of social movements. They can be classified as 1. Redemptive or transformatory, 2. Reformist, and 3. Revolutionary. A redemptive social movement aims to bring about a change in the personal consciousness and actions of its individual members. 
For instance, people in the Ezava community in Kerala were led by Narayana Guru to change their social practices. Reformist social movements strive to change the existing social and political arrangements through gradual, incremental steps. The 1960s movement for the reorganization of Indian states on the basis of language in the recent Right to Information campaign are examples of reformist movements. Revolutionary social movements attempt to radically transform social relations, often by capturing state power. The Bolshevik Revolution in Russia that deposed the Tsar to create a communist state and the Naxalite movement in India that seeks to remove oppressive landlords and state officials can be described as revolutionary movements. As you might discover when you try to classify a social movement in terms of this typology, most movements have a mix of redemptive, reformist and revolutionary elements. Or the orientation of a social movement may shift over time such that it starts off with, say, revolutionary objectives and becomes reformist. A movement may start from a phase of mass mobilization and collective protest to become more institutionalized. Amr 2004 Social scientists who study the life cycles of social movements call this a move towards social movement organizations. How a social movement is perceived and classified is always a matter of interpretation. It differs from one section to another. For instance, what was a mutiny, or rebellion, for British? Colonial rulers in 1857 was the first war of independence for Indian nationalists. A mutiny is an act of defiance against legitimate authority, i.e., the British rule. A struggle for independence is a challenge to the very legitimacy of British rule. This shows how people attach different meanings to social movements. Another way of classifying, old and new. For much of the 20th century social movements were class-based such as working class movements and peasant movements or anti-colonial movements. While anti-colonial movements united entire people into national liberation struggles, class-based movements united classes to fight for their rights. The most fairyching social movements of the last century thus have been class-based or based on national liberation struggles. You have read in your history books about the workers' movements in Europe that gave rise to the international communist movement. Besides bringing about the formation of communist and socialist states across the world, most notably in the Soviet Union, China, and Cuba, these movements also led to the reform of capitalism. The creation of welfare states that protected workers' rights and offered universal education, health care and social security in the capitalist nations of Western Europe was partly due to political pressure created by the communist and socialist movements. The movement against colonialism has been as influential as the movement against capitalism. Since capitalism and colonialism have usually been interlinked through forms of imperialism, social movements have simultaneously targeted both these forms of exploitation. That is, nationalist movements have mobilized against rule by a foreign power as well as against the dominance of foreign capital. The decades after the Second World War witnessed the end of empire and the formation of new nation-states as a result of nationalist movements in India, Egypt, Indonesia, and many other countries. Since then, another wave of social movements occurred in the 1960s and early 1970s. This was the time of the war in Vietnam where forces led by the United States of America were involved in a bloody conflict in the former French colony against communist guerrillas. In Europe, Paris was the nucleus of a vibrant students' movement that joined workers' parties in a series of strikes protesting against the war. Across the Atlantic, the United States of America was experiencing a surge of social protest. The civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King had been followed by the Black Power movement led by Malcolm X. The anti-war movement was joined by tens of thousands of students who were being compulsorily drafted by the government to go and fight in Vietnam. The women's movement and the environmental movement also gained strength during this time of social ferment. It was difficult to classify the members of these so-called new social movements as belonging to the same class or even nation. Rather than a shared class identity, participants felt that they shared identities as students, women, blacks, or environmentalists. 
How are the old social movements, often based on class-related issues like the trade union or peasant movements different from the new social movements like the environmental or women or tribal movements? You are already familiar with the many instances of trade union movements and workers' struggles in Chapter 5. Distinguishing the new social movement from the old social movements. We have already seen that the historical contexts were different. That was a period when nationalist movements were overthrowing colonial powers. And working class movements in the capitalist West were resting better wages, better living conditions, social security, free schooling and health security from the state. That was also a period when socialist movements were establishing new kinds of states and societies. The old social movements clearly saw reorganization of power relations as a central goal. The old social movements functioned within the frame of political parties. The Indian National Congress led the Indian National Movement. The Communist Party of China led the Chinese Revolution. Today some believe that, old, class-based political action led by trade unions and workers' parties is on the decline. Others argued that in the affluent West with its welfare state, issues of class-based exploitation and inequality were no longer central concerns. So that new, social movements were not about changing the distribution of power in society but about quality of life issues such as having a clean environment. In the old social movements, the role of political parties was central. Political scientist Rajni Kothari attributes the surge of social movements in India in the 1970s to people's growing dissatisfaction with parliamentary democracy. Kothari argues that the institutions of the state have been captured by elites. Due to this, electoral representation by political parties is no longer an effective way for the poor to get their voices heard. People left out by the formal political system join social movements or non-party political formations in order to put pressure on the state from outside. Today, the broader term of civil society is used to refer to both old social movements represented by political parties and trade unions. And to new non-governmental organizations, women's groups, environmental groups and tribal activists. As you read about the various dimensions of social change in India you would have been struck by the fact that globalization has been reshaping people's lives in industry and agriculture, culture and media. Often firms are transnational. Often legal arrangements that are binding are international such as the regulations of the World Trade Organization, WTO. Environmental and health risks, fears of nuclear warfare are global in nature. Not surprisingly therefore many of the new social movements are international in scope. What is significant, however, is that the old and new movements are working together in new alliances such as the World Social Forum that have been raising awareness about the hazards of globalization. Can we apply the distinction between old and new social movements in the Indian context? India has experienced a whole array of social movements involving women, peasants, Dalits, Adivasis, and others. Can these movements be understood as new social movements? Gail Ombed in her book Reinventing Revolution points out that concerns about social inequality and the unequal distribution of resources continue to be important elements in these movements. Peasant movements have mobilized for better prices for their produce and protested against the removal of agricultural subsidies. Dalit laborers have acted collectively to ensure that they are not exploited by upper caste landowners and moneylenders. The women's movement has worked on issues of gender discrimination in diverse spheres like the workplace and within the family. At the same time, these new social movements are not just about old issues of economic inequality nor are they organized along class lines alone. Identity politics, cultural anxieties and aspirations are essential elements in creating social movements and occur in ways that are difficult to trace to class-based inequality. Often, these social movements unite participants across class boundaries. For instance, the women's movement includes urban, middle-class feminists as well as poor peasant women. The regional movements for separate statehood bring together different groups of people who do not share homogeneous class identities. In a social movement, questions of social inequality can occur alongside other, equally important, issues. This will be clear when we discuss the Chipko movement later. 8.4 Ecological Movements
For much of the modern period the greatest emphasis has been laid on development. Over the decades there has been a great deal of concern about the unchecked use of natural resources and a model of development that creates new needs that further demands greater exploitation of the already depleted natural resources. This model of development has also been critiqued for assuming that all sections of people will be beneficiaries of development. Thus big dams displace people from their homes and sources of livelihood. Industries displace agriculturalists from their homes and livelihood. The impact of industrial pollution is yet another story. Here we take just one example of an ecological movement to examine the many issues that are interlinked in an ecological movement. The Chipko movement, an example of the ecological movement, in the Himalayan foothills is a good example of such intermingled interests and ideologies. According to Ramachandra Guha in his book On Quiet Woods, villagers rallied together to save the oak and rhododendron forests near their villages. When government forest contractors came to cut down the trees, villagers, including large numbers of women, stepped forward to hug the trees to prevent their being felled. At stake was the question of villagers' subsistence. All of them relied on the forest to get firewood, fodder and other daily necessities. This conflict placed the livelihood needs of poor villagers against the government's desire to generate revenues from selling timber. The economy of subsistence was pitted against the economy of profit. Along with this issue of social inequality, villagers versus a government that represented commercial, capitalist interests, the Chipko movement also raised the issue of ecological sustainability. Cutting down natural forests was a form of environmental destruction that had resulted in devastating floods and landslides in the region. For the villagers, these red and green issues were interlinked. While their survival depended on the survival of the forest, they also valued the forest for its own sake as a form of ecological wealth that benefits all. In addition, the Chipko movement also expressed the resentment of hill villagers against a distant government headquartered in the plains that seemed indifferent and hostile to their concerns. So concerns about economy, ecology and political representation underlay the Chipko movement. 8.5 Class-Based Movements Peasant Movements Peasant movements or agrarian struggles have taken place from pre-colonial days. The movements in the period between 1858 and 1914 tended to remain localized, disjointed and confined to particular grievances. Well known are the Bengal Revolt of 1859-1862 against the Indigo Plantation System and the Deccan Riots, of 1857 against moneylenders. Some of these issues continued into the following period, and under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi became partially linked to the independence movement. For instance, the Berdala Sidiagraha, 1928, Surat District, a non-tax campaign is part of the nationwide non-cooperative movement, a campaign of refusal to pay land revenue and the Champaran Sidiagraha, 1917-1918, directed against indigo plantations. In the 1920s, protest movements against the forest policies of the British government and local rulers arose in certain regions. Recall our discussion on structural changes in Chapter 1. Between 1920 and 1940 peasant organizations arose. The first organization to be founded was the Bihar Provincial Kizan Sabha, 1929, and in 1936 the All India Kizan Sabha. The peasants organized by the Sabhas demanded freedom from economic exploitation for peasants, workers and all other exploited classes. At the time of independence we had the two most classical cases of peasant movements, namely the Tebaga movement, 1946-1947, and the Telangana movement, 1946-1951. The first was a struggle of sharecroppers in Bengal and North Bihar for two-thirds share of their produce instead of the customary half. It had the support of the Kizan Sabha and the Communist Party of India CPI. The second, directed against the feudal conditions in the princely state of Hyderabad and was led by the CPI. Certain issues which had dominated colonial times changed after independence. For land reforms, zamindari abolition, declining importance of land revenue and public credit system began to alter rural areas. The period after 1947 was characterized by two major social movements. The Naxalite struggle and the New Farmers' Movements. 
The Naxalite movement started from the region of Naxalbari, 1967, in Bengal. The central problem for peasants was land. You have a clear understanding of the sharp divisions within the agrarian structure in rural India from Chapter 4. Boxes 1 and 2 provide two brief accounts of the movement. Many of the agrarian problems persist in contemporary India. Chapter 4 has discussed these in detail. The Naxal movement is a growing force even today. The so-called, New Farmers movements began in the 1970s in Punjab and Tamil Nadu. These movements were regionally organized for non-party, and involved farmers rather than peasants. Farmers are said to be market-involved as both commodity producers and purchasers. The basic ideology of the movement was strongly anti-state and anti-urban. The focus of demand were price and related issues, for example price procurement, remunerative prices, prices for agricultural inputs, taxation, non-repayment of loans. Novel methods of agitation were used, blocking of roads and railways, refusing politicians and bureaucrats entry to villages, and so on. It has been argued that the farmers' movements have broadened their agenda and ideology and include environment and women's issues. Therefore, they can be seen as a part of the worldwide, new social movements. Workers' movements. Factory production began in India in the early part of the 1860s. You will recall our discussion on the specific character of industrialization in the colonial period. The general pattern of trade set up by the colonial regime was one under which raw materials were procured from India and goods manufactured in the United Kingdom were marketed in the colony. These factories were, thus established in the port towns of Calcutta, Kolkata, and Bombay, Mumbai. Later factories were also set up in Madras, Chennai. Tea plantations in Assam were established as early as 1839. In the early stages of colonialism, labor was very cheap as the colonial government did not regulate either wages or working conditions. You will remember the manner in which the colonial government ensured supply of labor in the tea plantations Chapter 1. Though trade unions emerged later, workers did protest. Their actions then were, however, more spontaneous than sustained. Some of the nationalist leaders also drew in the workers into the anti-colonial movement. The war led to the expansion of industries in the country but it also brought a great deal of misery to the poor. There were food shortage and sharp increase in prices. There were waves of strikes in the textile mills in Bombay. In September and October 1917 there were around 30 recorded strikes. Jute workers in Calcutta struck work. In Madras, the workers of Butchingham and Carnatic Mills Binnies, struck work for increased wages. Textile workers in Ahmedabad struck work for increase in wages by 50%. Bomek 2004. The first trade union was established in April 1918 in Madras by B.P. Wadia, a social worker and member of the Theosophical Society. During the same year, Mahatma Gandhi founded the Textile Labour Association, TLA. In 1920 the All India Trade Union Congress, AITUC, was formed in Bombay. The AITUC was a broad-based organization involving diverse ideologies. The main ideological groups were the communists led by S.A. Dang and M.N. Roy, the moderates led by M. Joshi and V.V. Jiri and the nationalists which involved people like Lala Lajpat Rai and Jawaharlal Nehru. The formation of the AITUC made the colonial government more cautious in dealing with labor. It attempted to grant workers some concessions in order to contain unrest. In 1922 the government passed the Fourth Factories Act which reduced the working day to 10 hours. And in 1926, the Trade Unions Act was passed, which provided for registration of trade unions and proposed some regulations. By the mid-1920s, the AITUC had nearly 200 unions affiliated to it and its membership stood at around 250,000. During the last few years of British rule the Communists gained considerable control over the AITUC. The Indian National Congress chose to form another union called the Indian National Trade Union Congress, INTUC, in May 1947. The split in the AITUC in 1947 paved the way for further splits on the line of political parties. 
Apart from the working class movement being divided on the lines of political parties at the national level, regional parties too started to form their own unions from the late 1960s. In 1966-1967 the economy suffered a major recession which led to a decrease in production and consequently employment. There was a general unrest. In 1974 there was a major railway workers' strike. The confrontation between the state and trade unions became acute. During the emergency in 1975-1977 the government curbed all trade union activities. This again was short-lived. The workers' movement was very much part of the wider struggle for civil liberties. In the contemporary context of globalization you have read about the changes affecting labor. The challenges before the trade unions are also of a new nature. You need to go back to chapter 5 and 6 to understand these 8.6 caste-based movements. The Dalit movement. The sun of self-respect has burst into flame let it burn up these castes. Smash, break, destroy. These walls of hatred. Crush to smithereens this e and sold school of blindness, rise, O oh people. Social movements of Dalits show a particular character. The movements cannot be explained satisfactorily by reference to economic exploitations alone or political oppression, although these dimensions are important. This is a struggle for recognition as fellow human beings. It is a struggle for self-confidence and a space for self-determination. It is a struggle for abolishment of stigmatization, that untouchability implied. It has been called a struggle to be touched. The word Dalit is commonly used in Marathi, Hindi, Gujarati and many other Indian languages, meaning the poor and oppressed persons. It was first used in the new context in Marathi by neo-Buddhist activists, the followers of Babasaheb Ambedkar in the early 1970s. It refers to those who have been broken, ground down by those above them in a deliberate way. There is, in the word itself, inherent denial of pollution, karma and justified caste hierarchy. There has not been a single, unified Dalit movement in the country now or in the past. Different movements have highlighted different issues related to Dalits, around different ideologies. However, all of them assert a Dalit identity though the meaning may not be identical or precise for everyone. Notwithstanding differences in the nature of Dalit movements and the meaning of identity, there has been a common quest for equality, self-dignity and eradication of untouchability. Shah 2001, 194, this can be seen in the Sadnami movement of the Chamars and the Chhattisgarh Plains in Eastern MP, Adi Dharma movement in Punjab, the Mahar movement in Maharashtra, the socio-political mobilization among the Jatavas of Agra and the anti-Brahmin movement in South India. In the contemporary period the Dalit movement has unquestionably acquired a place in the public sphere that cannot be ignored. This has been accompanied by a growing body of Dalit literature. Backward class castes movements. The emergence of backward castes, classes as political entities has occurred both in the colonial and post-colonial contexts. The colonial state often distributed patronage on the basis of caste. It made sense, therefore, for people to stay within their caste for social and political identity and institutional life. It also influenced similarly placed caste groups to unite themselves and to form what has been termed a horizontal stretch. Caste thus began to lose its ritual content and become more and more secularized for political mobilization. Recall the discussion on secularization in Chapter 2. The term, backward classes, has been in use in different parts of the country since the late 19th century. It began to be used more widely in Madras Presidency since 1872, in the princely state of Mysore since 1918, and in Bombay Presidency since 1925. From the 1920s, a number of organizations united around the issue of caste sprang up in different parts of the country. These included the United Provinces Hindu Backward Classes League, All India Backward Classes Federation, All India Backward Classes League. In 1954, 88 organizations were counted working for the backward classes. The upper caste response. The increasing visibility of both Dalits and other backwards classes has led to a feeling among sections of the upper caste that they are being given short shrift. 
The government, they feel, does not pay any heed to them because they are numerically not significant enough. As sociologists we need to recognize that such a feeling does exist and then we need to scrutinize to what extent such an impression is grounded on empirical facts. We also need to ask why earlier generations from the so-called upper castes did not think of caste as a living reality of modern India. Box 8.12 provides an obvious sociological explanation. By and large when compared to the situation prevailing before independence, the condition of all social groups, including the lowest caste and tribes, has improved today. But by how much has it improved? How have the lowest castes, tribes fared in comparison to the rest of the population? It is true that in the early part of the 21. Street. Century, the variety of occupations and professions among all caste groups is much wider than it was today. However, this does not change the massive social reality that the overwhelming majority of those in the highest or most preferred occupations are from the upper castes, while the vast majority of those in the menial and despised occupations belong to the lowest castes. Issues of discrimination and exclusion have been discussed at some length in Book 1. 8.7 The Tribal Movements Different tribal groups spread across the country may share common issues. But the distinctions between them are equally significant. Many of the tribal movements have been largely located in the so-called tribal belt, in middle India, such as the Santhals, Hos, Orans, Mundas and Chota Nagpur and the Santhal Parganas. The region constitutes the main part of what has come to be called Jharkhand. We will not be able to go into any detailed account of the different movements. We take Jharkhand as an example of a tribal movement with a history that goes back a hundred years. We also briefly touch on the specificity of the tribal movements in the northeast but fail to deal comprehensively the many differences that exist between one tribal movement and another within the region. Jharkhand. Jharkhand is one of the newly formed states of India, carved out of South Bihar in the year 2000. Behind the formation of this state lies more than a century of resistance. The social movement for Jharkhand had a charismatic leader in Bursa Munda, an Adivasi who led a major uprising against the British. After his death, Bursa became an important icon of the movement. Stories and songs about him can be found all over Jharkhand. The memory of Bursa's struggle was also kept alive by writing. Christian missionaries working in South Bihar were responsible for spreading literacy in the area. Literate Adivasis began to research and write about their history and myths. They documented and disseminated information about tribal customs and cultural practices. This helped create a unified ethnic consciousness and a shared identity as Jharkhandis. Literate Adivasis were also in a position to get government jobs so that, over time, a middle-class Adivasi intellectual leadership emerged that formulated the demand for a separate state and lobbied for it in India and abroad. Within South Bihar, Adivasis shared a common hatred of Dikas, migrant traders and moneylenders who had settled in the area and grabbed its wealth, impoverishing the original residents. Most of the benefits from the mining and industrial projects in this mineralric region had gone to Dikas even as Adivasi lands had been alienated. Adivasi experiences of marginalization and their sense of injustice were mobilized to create a shared Jharkhandi identity and inspire collective action that eventually led to the formation of a separate state. The issues against which the leaders of the movement in Jharkhand agitated were, 1. Acquisition of land for large irrigation projects and firing ranges. 2. Survey and settlement operations, which were held up, camps closed down, etc. 3. Collection of loans, rent and cooperative dues, which were resisted. 4. Nationalization of forest produces which they boycotted. The Northeast. The process of state formation initiated by the Indian government following the attainment of independence generated disquieting trends in all the major hill districts in the region. Conscious of their distinct identity and traditional autonomy the tribes were unsure of being incorporated within the administrative machinery of Assam. The rise of ethnicity in the region is thus a response to cope with the new situation which developed as a consequence of the tribe's contact with a powerful alien system. Long isolated from the Indian mainstream the tribes were able to maintain their own worldview and social and cultural institutions with little external influence. 
While the earlier phase showed a tendency towards secessionism, this trend has been replaced by a search for autonomy within the framework of the Indian constitution. One of the key issues that bind tribal movements from different parts of the country is the alienation of tribals from forest lands. In this sense ecological issues are central to tribal movements. Just as cultural issues of identity and economic issues such as inequality are. This brings us back to the question about the blurring of old and new social movements in India. 8.8 The Women's Movement. The 19th century social reform movements and early women's organizations. You are already familiar with the 19th century social reform movements that raised various issues concerning women. Chapter 2 had dealt with it as did the earlier book. The early 20th century saw the growth of women's organizations at a national and local level. The Women's India Association, WIA, 1917, All India Women's Conference, AIWC, 1926, National Council for Women in India, NCWI, 1925, are ready names that we can mention. While many of them began with a limited focus, their scope extended over time. For instance, the AIWC began with the idea that women's welfare and politics were mutually exclusive. Few years later the presidential address stated, can the Indian man or woman be free if India be a slave? How can we remain dumb about national freedom, the very basis of all great reforms? Chaudhary 1993, 149. It can be argued that this period of activity did not constitute a social movement. It can be argued otherwise too. Let us recall some of the features that characterize social movements. It did have organizations, ideology, leadership, a shared understanding and the aim of bringing about changes on a public issue. What they succeeded together was to create an atmosphere where the women's question could not be ignored. Agrarian struggles and revolts. It is often assumed that only middle-class educated women are involved in social movements. Part of the struggle has been to remember the forgotten history of women's participation. Women participated along with men in struggles and revolts originating in tribal and rural areas in the colonial period. The Tevaga movement in Bengal, the Telangana arms struggle from the erstwhile Nizam's rule, and the Warli tribal's revolt against bondage in Maharashtra are some examples. Post-1947. An issue that is often raised is that if there was an active women's movement before 1947, whatever happened afterwards. One explanation has been that many of the women activists who were also involved in the nationalist movement got involved in the nation-building task. Others cite the trauma of partition as responsible for the lull. In the mid-1970s there was a renewal of the women's movement in India. Some call it the second phase of the Indian women's movement. While many of the concerns remained the same there were changes both in terms of organizational strategy as well as ideologies. There was the growth of what is termed as the autonomous women's movements. The term, autonomy, referred to the fact that they were, autonomous, or independent from political parties as distinct from those women's organizations that had links with political parties. It was felt that political parties tended to marginalize issues of women. Apart from organizational changes, there were new issues that were focused upon. For instance, violence against women. Over the years there have been numerous campaigns that have been taken up. You may have noticed that application for school forms have both fathers and mothers' names. This was not always true. Likewise important legal changes have taken place thanks to the campaign by the women's movement. Issues of land rights, employment have been fought alongside rights against sexual harassment and dowry. There has been recognition too that while all women are in some way disadvantaged vis-a-vis -vis men, all women do not suffer the same level or kind of discrimination. The concerns of the educated middle class woman are different from the peasant woman just as the concern of the Dalit woman is different from the upper caste woman. Let us take the example of violence. There has also been greater recognition that both men and women are constrained by the dominant gender identities. For instance men in patriarchal societies feel they must be strong and successful. It is not manly, to express oneself emotionally. A gender-just society would allow both men and women to be free. 
This of course rests on the idea that for true freedom to grow and develop injustices of all kind have to end. Conclusion. As we reach the end of the book, it is perhaps relevant to go back to where we began in our first sociology book in class 11. We had begun by discussing the dialectical relationship between the individual and society. Social movements perhaps best shows this relationship. They arise because individuals and social groups seek to change their conditions. Thereby they change both themselves and society. Biox 8.1 The right to vote. Universal adult franchise, or the right of every adult to vote, is one of the foremost rights guaranteed by the Indian constitution. It means that we cannot be governed by anyone other than the people we have ourselves elected to represent us. This right is a radical departure from the days of colonial rule when ordinary people were forced to submit to the authority of colonial officers who represented the interests of the British Crown. However, even in Britain, not everyone was allowed to vote. Voting rights were limited to propertyowning men. Chartism was a social movement for parliamentary representation in England. In 1839, more than 1.25 million people signed the People's Charter asking for universal male suffrage, voting by ballot, and the right to stand for elections without owning property. In 1842, the movement managed to collect 3.25 million signatures, a huge number for a tiny country. Yet, it was only after World War I, in 1918 that all men over 21, married women, women owning houses, and women university graduates over the age of 30, got the right to vote. When the suffragettes, women activists, took up the cause of all adult women's right to vote, they were bitterly opposed and their movement violently crushed. Box 8.2. The Repertoire of Sidiagraha. The fusion of foreign power and capital was the focus of social protest during India's nationalist struggle. Mahatma Gandhi wore khadi, hand-spun, hand-woven cloth, to support Indian cotton growers, spinners and weavers whose livelihoods had been destroyed by the government policy of favoring mill-made cloth. The legendary dandy march to make salt was a protest against British taxation policies that placed a huge burden on consumers of basic commodities in order to benefit the empire. Gandhi took items of everyday mass consumption like cloth and salt, and transformed them into symbols of resistance. Bhimal Dada Saheb Moore, 1970. Speech by Ankush Kale who was born in a party community at a public meeting. Parthas are very skillful hunters. Yet society recognizes us only as criminals. Our community has to undergo police torture under the charge of theft. Whenever there is a theft in the village, it is we who get arrested. The police exploit our women folk and we have to witness their humiliation. Society tries to keep us at a distance because we are called thieves. But have people ever tried to give us a thought? Why do our people steal? It is this society that is responsible for turning us into thieves. They never employ us because we are part us. Box 8.4 Studies on poor women in South Asia has shown that often they are forced to give their small savings to their husbands who demand it for their drinks. They then devised a way out by hiding their money in two places. When they were forced to give up their hard-earned saving, they gave the money from of one of the hiding places. And thereby ensured the safety of the other saving. Box 8.5. Chipko Movement. The unusually heavy monsoon of 1970 precipitated the most devastating flood in living memory. In the Alananda Valley, water inundated 100 square kilometers of land, washed away six metal bridges and 10 kilometers of motor roads, 24 buses and several other vehicles, 366 houses collapsed and 500 acres of standing paddy crops were destroyed. The loss of human and bovine life was considerable. The 1970 floods mark a turning point in the ecological history of the region. Villagers, who bore the brunt of the damage, were beginning to perceive the hitherto tenuous links between deforestation, landslides and floods. It was observed that some of the villages most affected by landslides lay directly below forests where felling operations had taken place. The villagers' cause was taken up by the Dashali Gram Swaraja Sang, DGSS, a cooperative organization based in Chamoli district. Despite these early protests, the government went ahead with the yearly auction of forests in November. 
One of the plots scheduled to be assigned was the Rennie Forest. The contractor's men who were traveling to Rennie from Joshamath stopped the bus shortly before Rennie. Skirting the village, they made for the forest. A small girl who spied the workers with their implements rushed to Gora Devi, the head of the village Mahila Mandal, women's club. Gora Devi quickly mobilized the other housewives and went to the forest. Pleading with the laborers not to start felling operations, the women initially met with abuse and threats. When the women refused to budge, the men were eventually forced to retire. Box 8.6. In our current information age, social movements around the globe are able to join together in huge regional and international networks comprising non-governmental organizations, religious and humanitarian groups, human rights association, consumer protection advocates, environmental activists and others who campaign in the public interest. The enormous protests against the World Trade Organization that took place in Seattle, for example, were organized in part through Internet-based network. Box 8.7. The Siliguri Subdivision Peasants Conference proved to be a great success. The peasants, quickened and strengthened by their earlier militant struggles, looked forward expectantly. Faces deadened and dulled with the grinding routine of labor on the Jodhadar's fields in sun and rain glowed with hope and understanding. According to Kanu Sanyal's later claims, from March 1967 to April 1967, all the villagers were organized. From 15,000 to 20,000 peasants were enrolled as Haltime activists. Peasants' committees were formed in every village and they were transformed into armed guards. They soon occupied land in the name of peasants' committees, burnt all land records which had been used to cheat them of their dues, cancelled all hypothecary debts, passed death sentences on oppressive landlords, formed armed bands by looting guns from landlords, armed themselves with conventional weapons like bows, arrows and spears, and set up parallel administration to look after the villages. Box 8.8 the guerrilla movement was heralded by the forcible cutting of crops from the land of a rich landlord at Garudabhadra, near Badapadu in the Plains area on 24 November 1968. More significant was the action in the hill tracts the next day, when in Pedagadili. Village of the Parvatapuram Agency area, about 250 Garijans from several villages armed with bows, arrows and spears. Raided the house of a, landlord cum moneylender. Dodden took possession of his hoarded paddy, rice, other food grains and property worth about Rs. 20,000. They also seized documents. Box 8.9. An unknown poet's poem, 1890s, on his fellow mayors. Their houses are outside the village, there are lice in their women's hair, naked children play in the rubbish. They eat carrion. The faces of the untouchables have a humble look. There is no learning among them. They know the names of the village goddesses and the demon gods, but not the name of Brahma. Box 8.10. Sociologists' attempts to classify Dalit movements have led them to believe that they belong to all the types, namely reformative, redemptive, revolutionary. The Antichaste movement which began in the 19th century under the inspiration of Jadaba Fulan was carried out in the 1920s by the non-Brahmin movements in Maharashtra and Tamil Nadu and then developed under the leadership of Dr. Ambedkar had characteristics of all types. At its best it was revolutionary in terms of society and redemptive in terms of individuals. In partial context, the post-Ambedkar Dalit movement, has had revolutionary practice. It has provided alternative ways of living, at some points limited and at some points radical and all-encompassing, ranging from changes in behavior such as giving up eating beef to religious conversion. It has focused on changes in the entire society, from radical revolutionary goal of abolishing caste oppression and economic exploitation to the limited goals of providing scope for members of scheduled caste to achieve social mobility. But on the whole, this movement has been a reformist movement. It has mobilized along caste lines, but only made half-hearted efforts to destroy caste, it has attempted and achieved some real though limited societal changes with gains especially for the educated sections among Dalits, but it has failed to transform society sufficiently to raise the general mass from what is still among the most excruciating poverty in the world. Box 8.11 the following observations were made by G.B.
Pant during a speech that moved the constitution of the Advisory Committee on Fundamental Rights, Minorities etc. We have to take particular care of the depressed classes, the scheduled castes and the backward classes, we must do all we can to bring them up to the general level, the strength of the chain is measured by the weakest link of it and so until every link is fully revitalized, we will not have a healthy body politic. Recent years have seen renewed debate about the state decision on reservation to this section. Box 8.12. To the generations born in Nairobian India, and specially to those who, like me, were brought up in traditionally upper caste but newly urban and newly professional middle class environment, caste was an archaic concept. True, it would be brought out figuratively mothballs to preside over traditional rites of passage, especially marriage, but it seemed to have no active role in urban everyday life. It is mainly now after Mandal so to speak that we are beginning to understand why caste was almost invisible in urban middle class contexts. The most important reason, of course, is that these contexts were overwhelmingly dominated by the upper castes. This homogeneity made caste drop below the threshold of social visibility. If almost everyone around is upper caste, caste identity is unlikely to be an issue, just as our identity is, Indians may be relevant abroad but goes unnoticed in India. Box 8.13 In the face of widespread unemployment, ecological degradation, and rampant poverty, a new ferment of political action began in the country. In some cases, the struggles were launched from party fronts or from joint fronts of coalitions of parties. An example of the latter kind of action is provided by the anti-price rise movement of Bombay and Gujarat in the late 60s. During the early 70s, in Krisisridden Bihar, a massive upsurge of students, supported Jayaprash Narayan's call for a total revolution. A large number of questions about power structures was raised, which included many about women questions about family, work, distribution, and family violence, unequal access to resources enjoyed by men and women, issues of male-female relationship, and women's sexuality. The 70s also witnessed the emergence of the autonomous women's movement. During the mid-70s, many educated women took to radical, active politics, and simultaneously promoted an analysis of women's issues. Groups of women came together in many cities. Among the incidents that played catalytic roles in crystallizing these meetings into organizational efforts were the Matura Rape Case, 1978, and the Maya Tayagi Rape Case, 1980. Both were cases of custodial rape by the police, and led to nationwide protest movements. Box 8.14. An analysis of the practices of violence against women by caste would reveal that while the incidence of dowry deaths and violent controls and regulations on the mobility and sexuality by the family are frequent among the dominant upper castes Dalit women are more likely to face the collective and public threat of rape, sexual assault and physical violence at the workplace and in public.